morning, Liberty. Welcome to the House of Friends. I'm Kevin. I'm filling in for Pastor Trey this morning while he's out of town. We all stand and join us this morning in worship.
Good morning, Faith family. Good to see you today. Welcome to the House of Friends. If you're a guest with us, then on behalf of all of us who call Liberty our church home, welcome. We're glad that you're here, spending part of your Christmas season with us. And I hope that everybody's Christmas season is off to a good start. Uh, We're right in the middle of it right now, so we're kind of operating on our holiday schedule here at Liberty. But just to remind all of you who may participate in our midweek activities, the next two Wednesday nights there will be uh, no student ministry, no Awana. We'll pick up both those ministries back in uh, 2018, okay, in January, so that'll be here before you know it. Um, If you're a guest with us and uh, you received a little connection card when you came in, we would love for you to fill that out for us and drop it in the offering plate on its way by a little bit later. If you have prayer requests, anybody has prayer requests, uh, please use that card, get it to us. We had a lot of them last week, and we pray for every single prayer request individually by name. So uh, if you want, if you have something going on in your life right now, you say, man, I just need some prayer partners. Use that card, drop it in the offering plate, and I assure you it will be prayed for this week, okay? Um, Hey, next Sunday is Christmas Eve. Just a reminder, again, as part of the holiday schedule, is that there will be no children's ministries next Sunday. Bring your entire family into the auditorium next Sunday. Whether you attend the 9 or the 1030 service, all the whole family is going to be right in this room, okay? And you're thinking, wow, that sounds like chaos. And you're right, it is. And you don't want to miss it. It's going to be so fun. Uh, I think we did it last year when uh, Christmas is on uh, Sunday. We had everybody in here. So it's, it's a good time. And we'll abbreviate the service somewhat because kids start melting down after a little while. But it'll be a great opportunity to celebrate with your church family and your family uh, the birth of Jesus. So that's next Sunday, 9 and 1030. Same service times, but everybody is in the auditorium. Hey, one more thing. Uh, Pastor Trey is out of town this weekend. And uh, by the way, worship team, great job. Thank you so much for stepping up. Give them a hand. Thank you, guys. They do a great job every Sunday. And, uh, but these Sundays when Pastor Trey steps away, uh, they step up, and we appreciate that so much. But uh, so Pastor Trey got away this weekend, and he's not going to make a big deal about this, but uh, it is a big deal, and I want to share it with you. And that is the reason he's gone this weekend is he's been working hard for, man, I don't know how many years now, on completing his uh, bachelor's degree in college, and he, he finally completed the degree, and he went this weekend to Florida, where the, the school is, to walk, to graduate, and so uh, it's a really a big celebration for him. I, some of you know, some of you, I mean, any time, college is hard, but anytime you've got a real job and a family and you're trying to earn a degree, I mean, that is, that is really tough. It takes a lot of perseverance. There are a lot of times when you feel like quitting, but he stuck with it, and uh, He's uh, received his bachelor's degree. I think we got a picture. Can we get a picture uh, um, from this weekend? Of tra- there you go, right there. Okay, <laughs> looking good in cap and gown. Um, and uh, so anyway, uh, so he's not gonna he's not gonna make a big deal about it. But I want you guys to encourage him when they get back uh, next week. Just to say, hey, way to go, man. Way to persevere. Heard about your graduation, and we're really happy for you. Um, bachelor's degree in church ministry and leadership, I think. Um, but anyway, we we celebrate with him, uh, and we'll seeing them back next week. Let's uh, get our offering team to come forward now, if we could, and continue worshiping the Lord through giving. And if you would, please bow with me, and let's ask God's favor upon our time together this morning. Gracious Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for your blessings to us. Thank you for the season in which we recognize the birth of your Son, Jesus Christ, our hope, our forgiver, our leader. We pray that our, as a result of our time together this morning, whether it be through singing or giving, or learning from your word, we pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts. We know you have a word for us today, and you want us to walk away differently and closer to you as a result of our time together this hour. So we're praying that your favor would rest upon it. pray that in Christ's name.
worship in song. I've called at least a dozen of these. Made my first one for my my baby boy. Boy, well, it's it, well, <laughs> gonna be an angel. At least the way I remember it. it was a long time ago. See, my 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 boy. Well, before he got born, I really didn't know who he was gonna look like. It worried me. Well. See, his, his mama, she found out she was pregnant. I didn't want to embarrass her. Baby wasn't mine. 
Just thought I was gonna let her go without making a fuss, you know. Then one night I had this dream, and there was an angel in it. And that angel, he told me I shouldn't be scared to marry that woman because it was uh, it was God's baby that Mary was having. You know, around here, we, we, we got a custom. When a baby gets born, daddy, he puts that baby across his knees. And that's his way of telling everybody that that baby is his. Well, it took a while for my heart to kind of get used to the idea that that baby was just on loan to me. He was special. But, uh, well, I made room for him. When he got born, I did what any daddy would do. I put that boy on my knee. I gave him a name. I called him mine. He grew up to a fine boy. Now, all these years later, well, you probably heard about him. He's grown into a fine man. You know, every time I call one of these, I remember what that angel told me. That Mary's boy, my, my boy, we, we're supposed to call him God with us. God with us. Yeah. I reckon that's all I've ever really needed to know. Oh, you ask me who my boy looks like, I'll tell you. He looks like God. Well, there's not a lot included in the Bible uh, about the earthly father of Jesus, uh, that is Joseph. He makes it into all the manger scenes, doesn't he? Um, but there's just not a lot of information about him in God's word, especially compared to Mary, his wife. Some have referred to Joseph as the forgotten man of Christmas. But although we just have a little bit of information in the Gospels about Joseph, God has some big lessons for us from his life. And as you know, in this series, What Child Is This?, we've been looking at the birth of Christ through the perspective of all these different characters and players in that first Christmas. Today, we turn our attention to the earthly father of Jesus, Joseph, and we're in part three of the series. We're going to be in the Gospel of Matthew chapter one. If you want to follow along in a Bible, Matthew the first chapter is uh, where we'll spend all of our time today. And uh, in Matthew chapter one, we find Joseph experiencing something that all of us will experience sooner or later. Most of us do not like it. Some of us, it just drives us crazy but it is a reality for every follower of Jesus Christ because there are going to be seasons in your life and in mine when we are forced to wait upon God. In fact, you might be in a season of waiting right now. You might be waiting for God to answer one of your prayers. You might be waiting for God to, to provide a certain need that you have in your life. You might be waiting on God to heal a relationship or to give you direction or wisdom about your next step in life. The reality is most of us really don't like to wait on God. And in Joseph's case, as we'll see in just a few moments, he was waiting on God to make some sense out of the chaos that had taken over his life as a result of his role in the birth of Christ. But it's not just we don't like waiting on God. We don't really like waiting on anything, do we? Most of us don't. I mean, we, we don't like to wait on anything. We're usually in a hurry. We usually view time as very precious. We like to get on to the next thing. And quite often we view waiting as simply a waste of time. I read an interesting article recently about some executives at an airport in Houston, Texas. And they were trying to address some complaints that customers had about how long it took to get their baggage at the baggage claim area. It just seemed like month after month, year after year, they would have this steady stream of complaints about how long people had to wait to get their bags after exiting their plane. Most of us have experienced that before, haven't we? 
I mean, you get off your plane, you exit your plane, you go down to the, the baggage carousel, and you're, and you're waiting and waiting and waiting. And it's about that time you realize that half the population has purchased luggage that looks just like yours, right? And, and, and you think it's your, oh, here it comes again. And, and so, so, so we're used to that. That's part of being at an airport. But apparently at this particular Houston airport, the wait time was just ridiculous and unacceptable. So the airport leadership knew they had to take some steps to correct the problem. So the first thing they did was to beef up their staff of baggage handlers. They hired more people, and they got more people involved in the process, and certainly that helped. They actually shaved eight minutes off the wait time for their customers. So they thought that was pretty good. And yet, complaint after complaint after complaint from these customers about how long it took to receive their bags. And then the leaders at the airport discovered the real problem. They went back and they looked at this airport and, and discovered that it was originally built and designed so that the, the, uh, the gate would be very close to the baggage claim area so customers wouldn't have to walk nearly as far. And they thought they were doing a good thing. They thought they were doing something that would be a service to their customers. But what actually it created was that they got to the baggage claim area so quickly, they just had to stand there and wait longer than anticipated. And they said, well, there's one solution to this. Here's what we'll do. They ended up moving the gates further away, making their customers walk farther to get to the baggage claim area. And guess what they found? It solved the problem. In fact, people started to compliment the airport. Their bags were waiting for them by the time they got there because it took them three times longer to walk from the gate to retrieve their bags. Initially, it only took about a minute. Now it took about three minutes to make that walk. And customers just figured, oh, wow, this is great. Wow, they've got them ready for us as soon as we get here, not realizing that they spent the time walking further. Well, in the article... They quote this guy from MIT. His, name's Re His name is Richard Larson. He's considered the world's leading expert on waiting. Now, I'm not sure how you get that title. I think most of us have earned that title, haven't we? We're experts on waiting. Um, but he's the expert, and here's what he says. The findings at the Houston airport are predictable. The problem people have with waiting is that they do not have anything meaningful to do while they wait. So they view it as a waste of time. And that's one of the reasons why you and I struggle with waiting upon God. Because really, in our heart of hearts, we just don't see the point of it. We view it as a waste of time. And I think this, uh, this story about Joseph, this account of Joseph, and, and how he was forced to wait to see how God's plan would unfold, reminds us all as followers of Christ that waiting on God is never a waste of time. Waiting upon God is an opportunity for God to test your faith, to challenge your faith, to exercise your faith, and to strengthen your faith. We don't always see it that way, right? Because, man, we, we want what we want, you know, right now. And yet, most of us who are followers of Jesus, man, we're asking God to strengthen our faith all the time, right? God, we want to have a faith that, that's strong. We want to be able to persevere. We want, we, want to, we want a faith that can really, you know, stand the test of time, can move mountains. We want a strong faith, and we ask God to give us a strong faith, but then we say, God, but please answer my prayers immediately. Don't make me wait. I want my faith to be strong, but God, don't make me wait for healing in my body or, or healing in my relationships. I, I want that to happen now. And we ask God to give us a faith that perseveres, and then we say, but God, bring along the right job, bring along the right husband or the right spouse or the right solution to my problem right now. I don't want to wait for it. And yet God knows that it's in the waiting that he strengthens our faith. It's not a waste of time. We view it as a waste of time because we're not usually doing anything, but it's not about us doing nothing. It's about God doing something in us, and that something is exercising our faith so it can be something stronger than it was. 
There's a great verse in the Bible in Psalm 27, verse 14, that talks about that. We can get it up on the screen. The psalmist says, wait for the Lord, be strong and take heart, and wait for the Lord. That's not a waste of time. Okay, that's not doing nothing. You're trying to be strong. You're trying to take heart, and you're waiting for the Lord. And that's where God grows our faith the most. Uh, Lewis Smead is a great author who's written extensively about this, and, and I love this quote from author Lewis Smead. We can get it up on the screen. He says, waiting is our destiny during this earthly life. We wait in darkness for a flame we cannot light. We wait for a fear we wait in fear for a happy ending we cannot write. We wait for a not yet that feels like a not ever. Nothing tests and grows our faith like waiting. And he's right. He's right. Nothing will test your faith more than just waiting on God to move, to act, to provide, to direct. And so we come to Matthew chapter 1, and we read about Jesus' earthly father, Joseph, and we realize that God forces him into this season of waiting, and he's waiting for God's plan to unfold. And it's always hard for us because we, we know how the story ends. We know how it goes, right? But, but these events are happening in real time in Joseph's life, and it was a tremendous stretch for his faith in God to just wait patiently and trust the Lord, and we'll see how that plays out in the chapter. Okay, so Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, let's pick it up. It says, this is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, before they consummated their marriage, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Now, there's a couple of uh, cultural things at work in this passage that I think uh, require some time for us to dig a little bit deeper. Uh, first of all, you see that it says that Joseph was pledged to be married to Mary. And in this culture, that was a lot different than what we would call a modern-day engagement. In that culture, pledged to be married had a, was a significant contract that you would enter into. In their culture, Mary and Joseph would have been committed by their families to one another for years. So it was a legally binding uh, betrothal period, okay? Um, some of you think, man, I wish we could get back to that, right? Some of you with kids, you're like, wow, I think we should go back to that time in which you get to pick the spouse for your children. Now, we didn't believe that when we were their age, right? But as we're older and wiser now, we say, oh, well, we ought to go back to that sort of thing. Well, that was the culture of that day that, that the, the parents, the families would get together and sign this contract. And so this Joseph and Mary, they entered into this contract, and their engagement, for their engagement to be terminated, therefore, it required, as the text says, a certificate of divorce. And that's why you see Joseph referred to as Mary's husband in verse 19. They weren't married the way we understand marriage, but they were in this, in, this, this uh, engagement, this, uh, this betrothal period but they did not consummate their marriage during this period. That was part of the next phase of the contract and their relationship. And then they would be actually married as we understand marriage. So we just need to understand that as we move through the text because this was no, you know, frivolous engagement by any means. This was a legally binding contract in which they were connected. So Joseph's plan to begin with was clear. Uh, you, you know, he's thinking, okay, Mary and I are pledged to be married. Okay, we are going to be married. We will consummate our marriage, and then we'll have children, and we'll live happily ever after. That was Joseph's plan. That was plan A for Joseph. But now Mary shows up pregnant and throws a real wrench into Joseph's plan. So he's got to come up with another plan. He comes up with plan B. Plan B is, I'll just divorce her quietly. I'll break off this engagement. I'll break this contract. I'll cut my losses I'll, get, I'll lick my wounds, I'll get over the hurt of Mary's unfaithfulness and betrayal, and I'll just get on with my life. So plan A, it didn't work out. Mary's pregnant. Plan B, according to Joseph, I'll just, uh, I'll just divorce her quietly. And, and you may be using a, a translation 
in verse 19 that says, Joseph being a righteous man planned to divorce her quietly. And that's a fine translation of that word. But, but the NIV goes a little bit further in actually defining what that term righteous means in this context. See what the NIV said, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law. That's actually what the term righteous means as it is used by Matthew here. Yeah, Matthew's not saying that, you know, uh, uh, Joseph was a good guy who didn't use bad language and went to church on Sunday. He, he's a decent guy. That's not what Matthew is saying. This was actually a technical term or a title that you had to earn. And the way you earned that title of being righteous is that you had publicly committed yourself through the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, the Old Testament law. So Joseph had made this public commitment. He, was a, he had this title of being a righteous man, one who was faithful to the law. Well, that means he would uh, honor the Sabbath. That means he wouldn't uh, eat foods that were considered unclean by the law. He would keep the religious days and follow the religious calendar. He was doing everything he could to be careful to follow God's guidelines as he understood them. So he worked hard to gain this reputation in the community of being a righteous man. And now this woman that he is engaged to shows up pregnant, and his reputation is clearly in jeopardy. And so he comes up with this plan B. I'll just divorce her quietly and move on. This wasn't how things were supposed to go for Joseph. He had a plan. He had a good plan, right? I mean, his plan was good. Plan A was great. I found the woman I love. We're going to get married. We're going to have kids. We're going to be happy. And that's a good plan. A lot of us sign on for that plan, right? That's a good plan. Doesn't work out that way. Well, he's got plan B. I'm going to divorce her, her quietly. In a moment, we're going to see <laughs> that plan didn't work out either. God had some other plans. But isn't that the nature of this life? I mean, you and I think about I'm all for planning, and, and, and I hope you have a, a life plan, some goals in your life. But how many of you know life does not usually go according to plan? There was a study done of 100 adults ages 22 to 40. And one of the questions they asked this group of adults, they said, okay, we, we want you to think about how you had a plan for your life between the ages of 18 and 22. We'll call that plan A. You think about the plans you had for your life between 18 and 22. That's plan A. And then they asked this group of adults a question. They said, okay, how many of you, now that you're between the ages of 23 and 40, are still living out that plan A that you had between the ages of 18 and 22? You know how many raised their hands? One woman, she was 23. <laughs> okay, everybody else had moved on to plan B or plan C. 75% of college students change their major sometime during the time they're in college. Well, we've got all these plans, right? We've got all these things lined up. This is how it's supposed to go. And yet most of us now have lived long enough to say, it just doesn't always go according to plan. And nowhere was that more true than in the life of Joseph. This whole thing with Mary's pregnancy was not part of his plan A, okay? And then he comes up with plan B to divorce her quietly, and we see in the text that's not going to work either. So look at verse 20. Verse 19 says he's, her plan is to divorce her quietly, but verse 20 says this. After he had considered this, and if, if you mark in your Bible or you're using a di digital version, you like to highlight things, you might want to highlight that word considered after he considered this, because um, the Greek word used there literally means to revolve in the mind. We know how that is, right? When, we, when we're making decisions, when we, you know, we've got a big decision to make, that's what happens. It just, it just we, it revolves in our mind. It just keeps circling around in our mind. We're considering it. We're deliberating it. What should I do? Should I go this direction? We're, we're figuring out the options that we have. We go to bed it's circling around in our minds. We wake up in the morning, and it's, and it's still there revolving in our minds. That was the, the laborious decision that Joseph had to make. What's going to be my next step? So after he considered this, 
an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. So he goes to bed that night and he's just like considering this and working it through in his mind. And during the course of the night, he has this dream and an angel appears and said, everything Mary told you is true. Now, if I was Joseph, I think I would be thinking, couldn't you have told me this a couple days ago? Right? I mean, because, because Joseph wasn't buying Mary's story. That's why he was divorcing her quietly. But now he's called Mary a liar. He said, you know, I don't believe what you're saying. This is crazy. Nobody else is going to believe this either. That's why, we're, I'm, that's why I'm divorcing you quietly. I just don't want to be a part of this anymore. And now the angel shows up and says, she was telling the truth, man. You ought to believe her. Joseph said, yeah, why didn't you tell me that 48 hours ago? That would have been better. But God's timing isn't always our timing. God doesn't always work according to our calendar or clock. But now Joseph knows. Mary was telling the truth. And you skip down to verse 24. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home to be his wife. Well, I want us to think about this for a moment and, and see how this account relates to you and I in the 21st century in our lives because most of us have plans and sometimes God makes us wait and our plans are not fulfilled or they don't go the way we expected they would. There are some real important life lessons for us in Joseph's experience. First of all, I want you to think about this. You know, Joseph decides to obey God. He, he obeys, right? The angel says, don't be afraid. Take, take Mary home to be your wife. Verse 24, he did what the angel of the Lord commanded him. But by obeying God, I want you to see, Joseph chose a very difficult path to walk. His plan of being married to Mary and having kids and living happily ever after would have been much easier than the plan that God has thrust upon him. But he's willing to obey. Well, just think about the details of it. I mean, his family and friends probably would have shunned him for marrying a woman they considered immoral or unfaithful. They'd be like, Joseph, what are you doing, man? You can't trust this girl. Or his reputation as a righteous man who followed the Old Testament law of God would be ruined because people would have just assumed that it's his kid. And they got together before they were legally married. So he would lose any social standing that he had earned in the community. Not only that, you know, the Gospel of Luke points out that Joseph was uh, financially poor. So, I mean, it's one thing to take on a wife and have to provide for her, but now he's got a wife and a kid, and he's really not all that well-to-do. He's struggling to make ends meet. So there would have been that factor to consider as well. Now I've got to take care of a little baby. And oh yeah, there is that thing about the evil king Herod who's put an edict out to kill all the male-born children in Israel. And so, and so now Joseph's got to figure out how in the world am I going to keep this baby safe when there's a, there's a contract out on his life. And it just seemed like one thing after another. And this plan that God has for Joseph is so far removed from what Joseph's expectations were for his life. Years ago, a, a couple of doctors developed what they called the life stress scale. I imagine some of you have read about this, in which they assign points to different stressors that you and I might encounter in life. And they called these points LCUs or, or life change units. And so each life change unit would be worth a certain number of points. And these doctors said, when your points reach about 300 or more, then you're in the danger zone when it comes to stress and anxiety. I mean, it's going to be bad for your health. You're on the verge of a breakdown if you hit 300 points or more. And so, for example, the stress, on the stress scale that they created, a marital separation, that's 65 points. Adding a family member is 39 points. Significant change in financial situation, that's 38 points. 
traveling over the holidays, 12 points. That seems kind of low, doesn't it? Depending on your children or if you're going to your in-laws' house. <laughs> oh, wow, you're in trouble. <laughs> well, anyway, so, so all these, they have all these points designated for these LCUs, these life change units. Well, somebody, somebody figured out all the stuff that Joseph was going through just based on the information we have here in Matthew, and he came in at over 400 points. Remember, 300 is like the danger zone, and now poor Joseph is over 400 points on the stress scale. I mean, his anxiety and the pressure upon him was immense. We don't necessarily see that when we just read through Matthew chapter 1, but if you can put yourself in his situation, these are the things he was dealing with in real time. You know, that may be where some of you are this morning. Just so many things piling up on you. And perhaps one at a time, you could handle it. Maybe two, but it just seems like one thing after another is snowballing in your life, and you're just starting to feel overwhelmed. And I can only imagine that Joseph was saying, God, when is it going to stop? I'm waiting at the baggage carousel, just waiting and waiting for God to come through, for God to come around the corner and solve the problems that I have. And if you've ever felt that way, then you and Joseph are kindred spirits because I have to believe he went through the same kinds of feelings. But did you catch the words of the angel to Joseph in his dream? Now, we've already learned in this series, don't we, haven't we, that, uh, that angels love to show up in the Bible, scare people, and then say, don't be afraid. Um, that happened with the shepherds, that happened with the wise men, that happened with Mary, that happened with Simeon, and now it happens with Joseph. Um, and once again, those are the angels' first words, don't be afraid. But this time it's different. It's different than in those other situations because uh, maybe it wasn't as scary because this was in a dream. Maybe it wasn't as scary that this angel came, showed up out of nowhere. But instead of saying, don't be afraid, you know, I'm an angel, in this context, the angel says, don't be afraid to follow through with God's plan. You see that in verse 20. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Don't be afraid of what people are going to think. Don't be afraid of uh, the needs that you're not sure how you're going to meet. Uh, don't be afraid of the sacrifices you're going to have to make as a result of being the earthly father of the Messiah. The angel saying, don't be afraid to be obedient to God's plan for your life. It's not your plan. It's not plan A. It wasn't plan B. But it's God's plan. And maybe God's word to you this morning is, you know, don't be afraid. Whatever you're going through, I've got this under control. This isn't, your, this isn't going according to your plan. I understand that. But, but I'm big enough to handle what I have put in your path, the road I've asked you to walk. You'll just be obedient to my plan and trust me. I'll take care of things. Don't be afraid. Very simply, that's what the Bible calls faith, isn't it? That's what the Bible calls faith. When I'm willing to trust God and obey his plan, even when I don't understand it, even when it doesn't make complete sense to me, maybe even when I don't even want to go that direction, but I see that it's God's plan for me today, so I'm willing to trust him. When we're willing to do that, God says, don't be afraid. You trust me. When we're willing to do that, God can do some extraordinary things. And you know what? In the text, we see that. Again, Joseph had a good plan to start. Get married, have kids, live happily ever after. That's a great plan. That didn't work out. So, God, so Joseph came up with another plan. I'll divorce her. I'll move on with my life. But God actually had a better plan. God actually had a bigger plan. And Joseph could have never imagined God's plan in a million years. He would have never come up with this. Verse 21, Mary will give birth to a son, and you, Joseph, are to give him the name Jesus, 
because he will save his people from their sins. And Joseph, I think, starts to realize that, hey, this is much bigger than me. This is much better than the plan I had. Through my family, I have the privilege and the opportunity to, to nurture and care for the Messiah, the one who will save people from their sins. I could have never imagined I'd be a part of that, this poor carpenter from Bethlehem. And he realizes that it was always a part of God's plan. You see that in verse 22. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. They will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And Joseph just had to marvel. Wow, what a plan. I never saw that coming. Here's the lesson for us. As you read the Bible, you'll see this. Some of the greatest things God does in the Bible happened when he deviates from the expected plan. You just see that time and time again. Man, when we went through the story, we saw so many examples of that. God did extraordinary things in ways that we never dreamed. He deviated what we thought would be a good plan. It was bigger and it was better. And some of the greatest things God will do in your life will come about not according to your plans, but according to his plans. So he's got some things around the corner. He's got some things in store for you. If you'll cooperate with him, if you'll be obedient to him as best as you know how, if you'll follow his plan to the best of your ability and understanding, you don't have to be afraid. It may not be the plan you had in mind. It'll be bigger, it'll be better, and God will do some extraordinary things through your life, things that you never dreamed or imagined. That's the story of Joseph. The forgotten man of Christmas? Yeah, we don't talk about him nearly as much as we do Mary. Some real life lessons for you and I where we live. Because most of us are not people of notoriety like Mary, right? Most of us are like Joseph. Well, God knows Joseph. God knows you. And perhaps his word to you is don't be afraid. You, you just be obedient to my plan. You cooperate with my process. I'll grow your faith. And I'll do some extraordinary things through your life. Let me ask you to stand, if you would, please. Let's close with a word of prayer. With our heads bowed, uh, maybe you came to church this morning, and you can, you can relate to Joseph. You can say, man, I, I got all these things piling up on me. You know, I'm, I'm stressed out. I'm anxious. There are so many things that seem out of my control, and that makes me uncomfortable. And, and hey, that's where Joseph was. You say, Pastor, man, I'm on that, on that life change stress scale. I am 300 plus. God knows that, and he cares about you and your situation. And his word to you today is his word to Joseph. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Your heavenly father has got this. You cooperate with him. You take your burdens to the cross and leave them there. And Jesus Christ will give you the strength you need to persevere. He'll give you the wisdom at the right time. He'll give you the direction you need at just the right time. Even if you have to wait, you can trust him. Just cooperate with him and be obedient. And you'll be amazed the way Joseph was of how God can use your life. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the example of real people like Joseph in the Bible. And... Uh, it's amazing to think how he was challenged, how he was stressed, how he was anxious, and yet how you comforted him and strengthened him and enabled him to do the right thing, to be obedient to you. And Father, I pray that would be our legacy as Christ followers. That even when we don't understand your plan, and when, even when you cause us to, to walk roads that are painful and difficult, when you put us in situations that are beyond our control, when you force us to wait, my prayer is that you would be strengthening our faith, that we would cooperate with you, and that you would develop in us a faith that is more precious than gold that can persevere in the midst of trial. I pray that in the precious name of Christ. You guys have a good day.